Hi everyone, my name is Terry, and welcome to Friday Fact Day, where I get to tell you about my work in fitness, feminism, and philosophy. And today's fact is... Now, you've heard of other types of literacy, I'm sure. Usual literacy, to be able to read and write. And maybe you've heard of computer literacy, or digital literacy, or media literacy, or maybe the math version, which is numeracy. But have you heard of physical literacy, and what does it mean? We're going to unpack that right now. Physical literacy in its official definition is the motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities. Okay, so whatever. Overly complicated and wordy definition aside, it really just means that you have the skill set, you've been taught the skills and had a chance to practice them that allow you to do physical activity with some degree of competency and enjoyment of it. And that you can also understand intellectually the benefits of physical activity and how to enjoy them. This actually is something that came out of academic work around physical education and sport and recreation education. And it came particularly from a professor called Dr. Margaret Whitehead. And it's officially entered uh, academic jargon in around 1993, but variations have been, have been around before that. Despite being around for close to 30 years now, physical literacy isn't really a well-known concept. It's only really in the last 20 years, depending on where you are, uh, that it's really started making its way into things like school phys ed, pedagogy, and into uh, sport coaching and fitness instructor training, and all of those sorts of things. So it's been around a while, but don't worry if you haven't heard of it before. It's going to be a new concept, especially to those of us who were already in school when the concept was created. And so we never got any access to it by the time it trickled into the school system. And it's now forming the foundation of really any of the physical activity areas of teaching. So school phys ed pedagogy, those of us who teach exercise and teach teachers who are going to teach exercise like me. Uh, anybody who works in kids' programmings and recreation, all of those sorts of areas are now using physical literacy as the foundation of our pedagogy. And pedagogy is basically the philosophy and the methodology of teaching, of educating. Now, the reason I want to talk about physical literacy is, of course, because it has been a very different concept for women than it has been for men over the last, well, basically most of human history until quite recently. There's always been women who have gone against tradition, gone against the grain, swam upstream to be involved in physical activity, sport, but other kinds of physical activity as well th throughout human history. That's not really unusual. But it, for those of us alive today, this is something that's really only become accessible since probably the late 70s, early 80s at best. And even then, it wasn't great. One of the things I've seen in the news, especially right now, because of course we have the Summer Olympics running, is that a lot of people are noticing that this year in particular, it seems that women are performing better. Frankly, that comes down to, in the grand scheme of things, physical literacy and other things connected to that concept. So physical literacy includes having the motivation and the confidence and the competence to be able to do different types of physical activity, sports, exercise, dance, outdoor activities, you name it. And that competence is where the physical literacy part comes in with what we're seeing right now with women performing better than ever before in sport. So much of physical literacy happens in early childhood that we actually have programs now for very young children to learn the fundamental movements. And if you're not familiar with the fundamental movements, there's seven of them. I did a video. I will link that down below for you. One of the academic sources that I use quite a lot in my work is a book called The Frailty Myth by Colette Dowling. And in it, she surveyed literally dozens of different studies that looked at the skill gap in childhood between boys and girls. And to really, really briefly summarize this and to really cram it down into a few sentences, basically, up until quite recently, girls have always performed the skills about two years to three years of maturity level and competency level behind boys the same age. So there would be expectations that a boy at the age of, say, let's say seven, could throw a ball with a certain amount of accuracy. A girl at seven would perform maybe the same as a boy who was only five. What the more recent studies from about the 1980s on up have shown is that with training, girls can close that gap really, really quickly. All the usual anatomy and physiology and kinesiology things that you hear about, about how uh, boys and men perform better than girls and women, really, it, it's, it's silliness. 
And unless you're performing at an extremely elite level, it's not going to matter anyway. So all that stuff about who's got more fast and slow twitch muscle fibers, who's got more muscle mass, who's got better bone density, who has different insertion points for where their muscles attach to bone, all of this stuff that you hear right now, especially right now with the Olympics on, that's not the thing, not even close to the thing that physical literacy is when it comes to determining who performs better in any given physical activity or sport. The reason girls historically have performed two, three, depending on the sport, two, three, four years behind boys of the same age is largely because of lack of access to early starts in a given sport and quality of training, equipment, and so on and so on and so on. When a child is showing early, early talent and potentially on the road to professional sport or to the Olympics or something like that, that's identified at quite a young age. So you look at how many sports there are out there where boys can start at three, four, five years old, but the girls version, like hockey is a great example. I know that's a very Canadian thing for me to say, but you know, eh, here I am. <laughs> but hockey, for example, has always allowed boys to start at a much younger age than girls. Well, by the time you're starting to get up to the high competition levels, the semi-pro levels, the, the career path levels and i mean in most sports that's junior high at the latest those extra two years that means the world in skill level and that's only just getting started at a younger age that's not to in, to even consider yet how many hours they get the quality of coaching that they get access to i mean the, you know the top coaches are going to work with the top athletes who are going to go pro if a girl's never going to go pro the top coaches aren't going to work with her and in a lot of sports a girl's never going to go pro and aside from early access and coaching, then there's all the other sort of more financial things like, do they get quality equipment? Do they get a nice gym to practice in? Do they get sponsorship for their, their uniforms or their costumes or whatever they need for their sport? Do they get um, all of the other things that go around supporting an athlete who might eventually get to the Olympic level? You can guarantee, and a, a quick Google of what some of the different uh, teams make in sponsorship is all you need to see. You can pretty much guarantee that the men are getting a lot more than the women. There's still a lot of places out there where whether it's sport, recreation, fitness, anything, the girls get the hand-me-downs that the boys no longer need because that gear's worn out and they're getting something nicer. And with so few girls historically having access to even the high quality training, did they have other teams to play? Do they have teammates to play with? Even that has an effect on how your career will develop if you're going to get, eventually get to world-class competition. Of course, for me, regular views of the channel know I'm interested in all of the intersections of all the different sort of things around gender that happen in our society that tell us that as women, we're not welcome in these physical activity spaces. And I really like how Colette Dowling sums it up. She calls it the bonsai effect. And if you've ever seen bonsai gardening, you know, it's taking a plant, a little tree or whatever, and keeping it in a very small, very tight, very constricted flower pot in order for it to grow in a very tiny, delicate sort of way. All of the restrictions around clothing and looking neat and tidy and ladies don't sweat and feminine comportment to be being graceful and delicate and small is having a bonsai effect on girls and women as we go through different stages of our lives. The other thing to consider when it comes to this so-called talent gap, which is of course really a physical literacy gap and an access gap, is that most sports, including all of the Olympic ones at some point in time or another, have been banned for women to participate in. The lifting of those bans of women in certain sports, some of those are more recent than you'd probably like to think. Women were only allowed to do boxing in the Olympics in 2012. That was the London Olympics. The ban on women's weightlifting in the Olympics only changed in 2000 at the Sydney Olympics. 21 years ago. So when you look at the ages of the women who are competing in the weightlifting competitions this week in Tokyo, many of them in their in their later 20s, they're in their 30s, some of them are even in their 40s. That change happened in their lifetime. So you can imagine they didn't get to start at a young enough age to build those skills and have a couple of decades of experience going into international competition in their sport. Now, you may be asking yourself how many years have men been doing weightlifting competitions in the Olympics? There's been Olympic weightlifting for men since the first modern Olympics, which was 1896. 
So men have had a 125 year head start over women in the same sport. Another one of my favorite resources on historical content, especially from a Canadian angle, is the book Out of Bounds by Helen Lenski. And she gives a little more statistical information about when some of these bans changed. The ban on women's wrestling, interestingly, didn't get lifted until 1985. And it varies a little bit province to province, but broadly speaking, Canadian-wide, 1985 is the number. Women's mud wrestling, perfectly legal. Gee, I wonder why that is. This is not all doom and gloom, folks. There is a bright side, there is an upside to this, and the upside is that when girls do get good quality training, we actually say, hey, here's how these movements work, here's how these different sport or physical activity skills work, and give them the opportunity to learn and practice, because so much of physical activity is about practicing. Then, then the gap can close. Thank you so much for watching. And please, of course, do all the YouTube stuff, right? The, the links and the buttons and the bell and all that stuff down below. Give those all some clicks. And next week, I will see you for a very special Friday vlog. I'm going to do a little Olympic roundup. Uh, the Olympics are ending on Thursday night. So uh, the Friday morning video when it goes up will be some of the highlights of all the gender stuff. As you can imagine, I have been screen capping and saving links and downloading non-stop since this started and I still have another week of that to go so I'm going to try to cram it all in one vlog next week and I will see you there and as always lift heavy fight the patriarchy and I'll see you for the next one bye